Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome along to our stream for November 9th. Gosh, uh, time is just racing along, isn't it? And here we are. Uh, the United States election is all sorted, isn't it? There you go. Um, and uh, that's a big change from last week, a big update from last week. I'm sure everybody's been on the edge of their seats as that's all played through and uh yeah we've got the first stream up and running good morning everyone i've been um actually out here for the last hour or so playing around with settings and uh, i uncovered what that issue was that was preventing those initial streams from getting up and running so that's all sorted from this point on we should be good good morning tatiana melissa and uh paul getting in there first um how is the study experience going oh that is really good coffee this morning really good uh this is a mm. Oh, very drinkable. Um, this was uh, an espresso. It was about 30 grams um, from 20 grams in. Uh, and about a 28 second shot, I would say, extraction. And uh, it was... Um, uh, I'm trying some beans from a roaster in Collingwood. Uh, actually called Proud Mary, and the blend was called Humbler. Proud, humble, plan words, I suppose. Um, and gosh, really um, very low acid, very drinkable, very chocolatey. Uh, not too strong, uh, Paul, interestingly. Really quite drinkable. Uh, and I think that is my fourth for today. Believe it or not, I've been at this since um, oh, about 6 a.m. this morning. Uh, so um, what's that? I'm pacing myself at one an hour. That's not too bad for me. Uh, I have been known to uh, drink more coffee, but that, that's pretty good. And um, I'm not feeling jittery at all, as one might do with drinking lots of caffeine so that's good it's a good blend how how do you guys approach um caffeination and study are you are you caffeine drinkers do you try to stay off the caffeine after a certain period of time so that you can sleep um do you sort of switch things up maybe according to the the time of your study period maybe you're drinking a little bit more coffee towards the exams when you're cramming a little harder or have you really um set out a timetable sketched out a, a timetable and you're you're sticking to that so that you don't have to cram how's the the study experience going for you oh good good to see you we've got a fellow coffee lover out there Hi, Melissa. You're having the time of your life? Goodness me. Coffee is the blood of angels. <laughs> Ew. Um, and um, I, I, I get that. Yes, absolutely. Um, oh, well, that, that's good. Having the time of your life is better than... Uh, that, that's actually a really... It's the first time I've heard somebody describe the study experience as having the time of your life. But I get it. I know exactly what you mean. Um, there is something so, I think, decadent and luxurious about taking the time to learn. And when you can do that and you've got ample time such that you're not feeling too pressured and you can actually enjoy the learning experience, I think there's a few things in life that are, are that are um more pleasurable Takiaya is caffeine free good for you well done um that is uh, uh good on you for coming out 
flying that flag in in a in a uh, this is a safe space this is a beverage safe space here in this stream um Hey, Chili, you'll find that when we are caffeinated, we actually dilate. So it's it's during the effect of, of caffeination, the um, vascular structure uh, dilates. Um, and the way in which this plays out, uh, um, varies according to the amount of coffee that people drink, uh, how often they drink it, uh, and how long they've been drinking coffee for. There is some evidence, uh, mind you, it's getting a little bit long in the tooth now from about probably oh, 10 years ago, gosh, time flies, uh, that um, heavy coffee drinkers' um, uh, vascular architecture in their frontal lobe doesn't actually really start to... <laughs> Um, really wake up and go in the morning until caffeine has been acquired. Um, yeah, good for you, Takiyaya. Well done. Fly that flag. I, I did go for a period of uh, without coffee for, for a long uh, time. Um, from about 2012 through to about 2015, about three years, I reckon, I did not drink coffee. Uh, I um, had uh, and, and just generally avoided caffeinated drinks altogether. Uh, was big on the chamomile tea, big on the uh, peppermint tea. Gosh, I haven't had a peppermint tea for a long time, but it can be quite a delightful thing if you can find a nice one. Um, so, uh, but but here I am. Uh, um, back on the juice back on the juice how is time pressure going for you all how's it feeling the the exam period at the moment we're at the 9th of um we're at the 9th of november so we've still got a little bit of time until the exam in fact, maybe Mind, Brain and Behaviour 2 hasn't even registered for you yet. Maybe you might be looking at other exams first. I would certainly understand that. Um, so it's two weeks today, isn't it? Two weeks today, uh, the exam. For most people, not necessarily for everybody, but for most people, it's two weeks today. So still plenty of time if you haven't even started studying to... Uh, start to think about how you're going to approach the exam, what type of mark uh, you want from the exam, where you're sitting at the moment, or what, what mark you want, I suppose, overall for the subject, and, and what you want, therefore, from the exam based on where you're sitting with your REP data and where you're sitting with your assignment score. You'll know then roughly what you would need to achieve on the exam to get you to where you have got to go and then what do you need to do to do that paul found his groove i'm taking it that's good um prioritizing personality and social first yeah why not they're really interesting areas of um of psychology aren't they gosh i tell you watching um the uh, American election unfold has been a very interesting um, opportunity to witness um, personality uh, and social uh, psychological factors uh, at play in the real world. And has really been very interesting, I think, from a, a research methods point of view as well. And... Um, looking at uh, just how much um, in the end it'll be interesting to see how uh, accurately I suppose the the various polls that have been based on uh, this sample or that sample have accurately predicted uh, the outcome of the election 
Hey Nancy, yes, if your Wi-Fi cuts out during the exam, you will be able to log in. Um, as uh, that's right, you'll be able to log back in. If your Wi-Fi does cut out, uh, then you should try to get back in as soon as possible, and you will be able to. So if it, it does drop out, um, you can. Um, get on out and come back in. In fact, you can even try that with the quiz. I think that's up on the on the LMS. It may uh, have a timer set. I can't remember. I tried to hide all the settings from you guys, but obviously there's been some thing where some people have been able to see the, the answers uh, to the practice exam, which were not actually the answers because we didn't think that people could see them. So I didn't bother setting the answers. So I've, I've seen on Piazza on the weekend that certainly for the clinical and research methods component of the um, practice exam, people have been freaking out because not all of the answers were what they thought they were correct, uh, were, were not what people thought they should have been. And that's right, because I was intending to throw these questions in the bin uh, after the practice exam and uh, not bother to show answers. But... Uh, I will, I have planned to, uh, and uh, I'll just do a little test here and see if this works. I have planned to share with you, or go through the questions with you today in this stream. Uh, if that's something you'd like, and that's something we can definitely uh, do. Um, and that looks like it's working, so that's good. Um, but long story short, uh, oh, now my phone's ringing. Sorry, let me decline that call. Whoever it is can wait. And I'm also filming on my phone uh, at the moment. So we can go through the, the quiz together. Um, and I've completely forgot what I was talking about. Uh, otherwise, mm, 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 mm. oh, that's right. Okay, so uh, coming back into the um, coming back into the exam, if you have an issue, should. Um, be, should be easy enough, unless the issue's on your end. Um, invariably, I think the issue will be on people's ends, on their their, their home uh, internet or whatnot. I'm not expecting a lot of issues. Most people have internet dropouts very rarely, uh, and most people who are using modern, uh, modern modems have modems like mine, for example, that go to 4G if the connection from the NBN drops out. Uh, but if you do experience any technical difficulties on the day, there's two things that you should you could do. So assuming that you're offline, uh, then you would need to call somebody, right? And, oh, okay, so I've just given you a link. So you should go ahead um, and call... Oh, somebody's really trying to get me on the phone. Sorry about that. You could go ahead and call. Uh, oh, it doesn't want me to paste all of this in at the one time. Okay. Let's break this up a bit. So technical support on the day inside Australia. We would call this number. And outside of Australia, we would call this number. So that is one thing that you could do um, to get assistance during the day. If you're having general technical assistance, it's this link here that you should go to, uh, sorry, if you're having general technical difficulties, it's this link here that you should go to. Um, and that will take you to 
In fact, I'll share. I'll share this with you now. Uh, so this is the technical support uh, page. I would suggest coming to this page in advance to um, look at uh, the frequently asked questions, the little videos and whatnot to make sure that you're comfortable with what to do on the day. I'll also post this link to this page just near the exams page um, on the LMS. So when it comes to the real day, the exam is going to be sitting, uh, if we go to, where are we, modules? And I've got this zoomed in so that we can look at the practice exam. But the, the real exam will be sitting at the top here. And I'll also have links to help. But you'll notice in the meantime, I've also put at the top of the page here, this exam support um, section. And this is a chat function. So if something happens during the exam uh, and you're experiencing a problem, you can start a support chat. Um, this is what you'll see on your end. You'll see a, a blue box saying start uh, a support chat and that will open a direct line to me. So while the exam is going on, I'm going to be sitting out here in cyberspace and uh, I will be waiting for uh, you to, uh, waiting to support you if you have an issue. And hopefully there won't be uh, any issues. Um, of course, like, the practice exam, you won't get the answers for the actual exam. We won't be telling you the answers, but the uh, exam has been checked already and will be checked by the time it uh, is published by six academic staff. Uh, so it's been uh, scrutinized all the answers to make sure that all the answers are correct and all the wordings correct and everything's fine. Um, all right, so I've been talking for a while. How are we going out there? Have we got any questions about anything that I've been showing there about the technical support, about the support chat on the day, um, about what to do if something drops out and so forth? And what do we think about going through the um, practice quiz uh, for the, the clinical and the research method sections? So that's 10 questions altogether, and that might be um, a good way to spend some of our time today. What do you think about that? Do you want to do that? got a slight delay because of the way that I'm streaming today. Um, I don't know if you guys have picked this up yet, that there's a about a 30 second delay. But uh, why don't we? All right. So thumbs up from Paul. Yes, please, says Rima. Takiyaya says uh, would really appreciate that. Fabulous. All right. So uh, let's. Um, do that then. Let me uh, share my um, screen with you. And as I go through, please feel free to jump in with um, comments or questions in the chat. And I'll keep an eye. I'll keep flicking back to them uh, as well. So let's have a look at the quiz uh, and the research methods and the clinical section of the practice quiz. Okay. Oh, there you go. There's the behind the scenes of the stream. Uh, so this is the 
uh, the practice quiz, as you know, there are um, 25 questions altogether uh, in this practice quiz. So let's have a look at specifically the clinical questions and the research methods questions. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to... Move our tab to another window so that I can chat with you guys and look at the chat at the same time as we look at the quiz. And you can certainly chime in with the answers if you think you know what the answers are. So this first one was asking us about what is an effective method of reducing stigma about diagnosable disorders like schizophrenia. And... Uh, I think there was a lot of conjecture around this one, and this might have been because uh, one uh, this was one of those questions where the um, the answer was not set correctly because of the assumption that nobody could see the answers. The correct answer here is A, education about the disorder. You guys have written about this. Yeah, good on you, Rima. Well done. Education about the disorder um, is... Uh, one way to reduce stigma about um, conditions like schizophrenia that are very um, uh, are very um, misunderstood or poorly understood. So the mechanism of change here is thought to be that through education you can replace. Um, counterfactual information or incorrect information with correct information and more often than not that correct information is less confronting to people than um, the correct information so you know most people have been educated about schizophrenia through just news reports and movies that um, sensationally pair the term schizophrenia or the symptoms of schizophrenia or descriptions of people living with schizophrenia with violent crime. Indeed, in one of my PhD students' um, theses, uh, he's just uh, finished his PhD, uh, there was evidence that... Um, any mention of violent crime in uh, a news uh, report is likely to increase stigma about schizophrenia, whether or not schizophrenia is mentioned. Uh, we've just become so conditioned to thinking about schizophrenia as a violent condition when, in fact, it is not. And it is far more likely that people with schizophrenia are victims of violence, not perpetrators. There is very mixed evidence, and I touched on this a little in our lectures, regarding the utility and the effectiveness of replacing the name of a disorder with another name. There's mixed evidence across cultures, but in no way would I say that this is a conclusive way to, uh, a, an effective way to reduce stigma about a condition. Um, for those of you who did Mind, Brain and Behaviour 1 and think about uh, Meredith's uh, learning and, and conditioning section. Um, I always come back to classical conditioning fundamentally around stigma. It's really easy to do, uh, and, and and that's because it is it all hinges really uh, upon um, classical operant social cognitive um, conditioning uh, dynamics. So um, Bloiler, for example, who you would potentially remember coined the term schizophrenia. Um, in uh, 1911, he wrote about uh, stigma associated with the previous label of dementia precox, which was only 13 years old uh, by that time. Uh, so, uh, and wrote that uh, part of the reason uh, that he was changing the label or pro proposing that the label be changed from dementia precox to schizophrenia was not only to represent this fracturing of associative processes that he theorized were at the 
core of the disorder, but also um, to try and reduce the stigma associated with that term dementia precox. Now, even back then, we're talking about uh, the turn of the uh, 20th century before, you know, social media and before television, um, before, you know, uh, the opportunity to be bombarded by mass media and, and films and so forth that would uh, demonize and mystify the experience of schizophrenia, there was already profound stigma noted by Bloiler associated with the condition. So um, that would suggest to me that it doesn't matter what you call the experience in time, um, the uh, experience will become stigmatized. Any label will become stigmatized uh, unless uh, the, uh, the public and, and um, mental health professionals and so forth are correctly educated about the condition and spend time with people who have experiences like schizophrenia and other experiences and um, that will help us uh, not be fearful uh, and not misunderstand uh, the nature of these complex mental health uh, issues like um, schizophrenia spectrum disorders. So Mayani, yeah, D is I was really evil, Mayani. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry about that. I did that evil, both B and you know, both both of these options are correct things that really made it look like, oh, that's probably the right answer in the context of those preceding two options um, that seem to be logically connected. Uh, yeah, I was a bit evil there. I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I put my Dr. Evil hat on for that one. If I had a... Oh, I do have a fluffy cat. I should have been stroking the fluffy cat when I... Uh, made that particular question. So, we all know that stigma is my pet um, uh, issue. Uh, so, I, I promise I will fit the, <laughs> the remaining ten, que remaining nine questions into the um, time that we have together. All right. So, uh, good. I'm glad this is helpful. Okay. So, which of the following is a sign of a major, excuse me, a major depressive episode? Firstly, we've got feelings of sadness and hopelessness, no hope for the future. Uh, changes in sleeping behavior. So a change could mean a decrease or an increase, I suppose, couldn't it? So maybe we're not sleeping as much as usual or we're sleeping more than usual. And hedonia. This is a difficulty in experiencing pleasure or an inability to derive pleasure from the things that we generally uh, experience um, a, a, a with, with some degree of pleasure. Everybody's weighing in with, with D. I think D is a pretty safe option, isn't it? Yeah, good work, everyone. So D, all of the above are symptoms of depression. That's very... True. So these are all experiences um, of uh, depression. You'd remember that all of the diagnosable disorders that we talk about in the clinical section of the course. Well done, Nancy. D is it. D is it. That's right. Um, they are made up based upon clusters of signs and symptoms that systematically cling together. And yes, there's going to be variation from person to person, but the, that variation occurs within a boundary, within uh, certain limits. And we do see common um, signs and symptoms that collectively co-occur such that we can confidently refer to them as a, a syndrome. And a disorder, a disorder that's differentiate, uh, able to be differentiated from other disorders. So yeah, these are signs of a major depressive episode. What is the extra points um, here? Uh, what can anybody remember? What, uh, which of the three? So A, B, and C. Which of those three are is one of the cardinal features? 
one of those cardinal features of a major depressive episode that we must see. There was two things that we wanted to, or not wanted to see, but we are on the lookout to see when we're assessing signs and symptoms for major depressive episodes. And one of the things that we can see on the screen here is one of those, one of two cardinal symptoms, two primary symptoms that we would say have to be present. Yeah, the C's have it. So, well, look, it's a little bit blurry, actually. But notice I'm I'm deriving a second question from this question. And Paul sort of has it as well. But yeah, anhedonia uh, is one of those cardinal symptoms. A depressed mood um, uh, is an is also one of those uh, symptoms and feelings of sadness can sort of tie in there. So a depressed mood uh, and anhedonia are the two cardinal ones. So sadness ties into the depressed mood. Yeah, that's right. So it's a little bit blurry. Hopelessness, however, is you can differentiate hopelessness here. So not everybody that experiences sadness will experience hopelessness. Hopelessness is very much tied to those sorts of um, thoughts around the future and whether or not the type of circumstances that we're experiencing right now that are uh, surrounding our our experience of depression are likely to endure into the future. so a low mood, a depressed mood, and anhedonia, they are the two core things you might remember. Hopelessness is something that may be there, but not necessarily. And uh, remember, we don't need um, depressed mood and anhedonia. It could be one or the other. It generally co-occurs to some degree, however. Uh, but again, hopelessness, not necessarily uh, for future reference. Um if you go on to be a psychologist, you should always be on the lookout for hopelessness. This is uh, one of the uh, core predictors of suicidal ideation uh, at attempt. Um, and something you'll always be on the lookout for your clients when you're working to um, not only manage your client's depression, but also manage your client's risk and to keep them safe. Okay, so let's have a look at question three. So here we have um, a question about borderline personality disorder. So with borderline personality disorder, uh, we are um, looking for uh, well, what which one of the answers do we think here is right for borderline personality disorder? So we've got an answer here about being commonly associated with unstable relationships. Um, it being a form of multiple personality disorder. Doubling the risk of heart disease. And including hallucinations and delusions. What do we think here? A, A, A. Lots of A's. Okay, everybody's on to the A's. Yeah, that's right. Good. Well done. It's very much um, a core feature of this experience of personality and this very um, not uncommon um, and and quite extreme uh, version of or experience of personality that unstable relationships will be part of the experience. This is very common. Um, The experience of borderline personality disorder is not a form of multiple personality disorder. However, there may be shared features around dissociation um, if the presentation is um, towards a a more complex and severe um, end. Uh, there's no direct risk of um, 
heart disease, uh, there may be a range of indirect um, routes that might increase prevalence for certain uh, physiological medical conditions such uh, don't quote me on heart disease, I'm not sure, but for a range of other things related to substance use. There can be hallucinations and delusions, again, with more severe and complex presentations, but typically these are not part of the disorder. Um, this would be psychotic features that could come with, um, in addition to the disorder. So yes, when we're talking about borderline personality disorder, we are talking about a pervasive pattern um, of, of thinking and feeling and behaving, um, which can uh, result in very unstable relationships, um, difficulty controlling emotion, particularly anger, experiencing um, difficulty experiencing uh, one's... Uh, oneself uh, or having a um, a poor self concept is very uh, common in borderline personality disorder. Not really having a very clear sense of 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 who you are. Um, we see uh, a, a pervasive fear of abandonment, perceived or real abandonment, um, and. Um, there can be uh, repeated and, and quite extreme attempts to uh, avoid uh, either real or perceived abandonment uh, as well. And um, this is a very particular uh, uh, type of um, mental health problem that ha requires a particular response from mental health professionals and um, the mental health system. Uh, and I've got a couple of papers coming out on this. In fact, you might have seen uh, a couple of articles from me in um, the university magazine. And, um, oh, let's see. So there was one in Pursuit and one in, hmm, where's the other one? Crokey, I think, where I've touched on borderline personality disorder as well. But have a look at the Pursuit one in particular, I think, for your interest uh, around the mental health system. And... Uh, what we see, what uh, I've sort of touched on there is essentially that the mental health system is not um, currently, uh, it doesn't currently have very good capacity to help people with borderline personality disorder. It can certainly do better. There are very effective treatments. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately borderline personality disorder is uh, very stigmatized in um, the health and mental health system. And there's a, a whole lot of work that needs to be done there to support people with borderline personality disorder, I think, um, better. And uh, that uh, is something that I am working on uh, with a colleague. Uh, Naomi, that's a good question. Uh, let me see if I can find... Um, Oh, where's our quiz? I'll leave that on the quiz. I'll go over here and I will find... Mm. So here is that particular article I was just talking about. Um, okay. So let's keep going on. Everybody got that, I think. Well done. The A's had it. So question four, imagine you're a psychologist. So this is where we need to think a little bit more critically now about what you've learned about the signs and symptoms of various experiences. Imagine you're a psychologist and your new client reports being generally mistrusting of others and only has a close circle of, of friends who they trust and those friends have proven their trustworthiness over time. What type of um, disorder might this person be showing signs of? And if they've come to you, it's more than likely that 
uh, the experience is, is impacting their life in some way. So A, narcissistic personality disorder, B, paranoid personality disorder, C, antisocial, or D, histrionic personality disorder. What should we think might be uh, what we're looking for here? So your client... We've got some answers rolling in here. Uh, Paul asks, do I regard complex trauma as being in the same league, so to speak, as BPD and schizophrenia? Yeah, interestingly, uh, the idea of... Um, uh, so, Paul, we talked about um, this idea of a biopsychosocial approach to conceptualizing uh, mental disorder being the, the sort of dominant paradigm of the day. And, and I, I think there's very good reasons for that. Most evidence points to uh, us having um, biological, psychological and social environmental uh, influences on our state of mind and on our experience of mental health. And I think all of these things um, uh, can be re uh, can uh, certainly be extended to BPD, schizophrenia, and so forth. BPD and schizophrenia are very different conditions. Um, each of these conditions, I think, more and more over the last twenty years, uh, have been. It's become recognised that trauma um, and traumatic uh, life events or stressful life events, adverse life events, maybe. Um, do play a role and certainly uh, childhood trauma. So, you know, there's some really good um, literature uh, demonstrating that uh, from Sarah Bendel, uh, who is uh, one of our previous um, students in the school uh, and now works at Origin. And in fact, is like myself, a previous PhD student of Henry Jackson. And Henry Jackson is the co-author of um, that article that I've just linked up on the uh, chat with you there. Lots of connections. It's a, it's a small world in the, the sort of uh, neuropsychiatry world. Um, and... Uh, she's done a lot of work demonstrating um, that um, people who have had childhood trauma are far more likely to experience positive symptoms like hallucinations, for example. Uh, BPD is quite commonly linked to uh, childhood trauma. Um, complex trauma, uh, repeated uh, trauma, is um, also very likely to uh, result in symptomatology very similar to uh, BPD. It's very um, easy to get confused between um, the nature of the etiology and the the resultant um, uh, experience in terms of signs and symptoms around mental health. Um, trauma, there's a whole trauma movement at the moment that is um you know really emphasizing trauma as being prime in um determining mental health outcomes and i don't know if i really support that i'm you know i i see the complexity in the issues uh and uh certainly you know if we think back to even the the classic caspi et al study that i showed you all uh, around gene environment interactions, there was a really powerful demonstration of vulnerabilities and environmental uh, factors needing to interact in a certain way. Um, it's complex. This is a very long-winded answer to your question, Paul. It's complex. I work very closely with people who are driving the complex trauma movement. Um and I get it. And I think more and more we've moved towards incorporating those environmental factors and stressors and adverse life events into our formulation of 
um, mental health problems and diagnoses and disorders. And I think that's a positive thing. Um, have a look at the power threat meaning framework uh, and you'll um, see a new way of thinking about mental health problems that is very much geared towards this trauma being the prime uh, factor uh, approach. As I said, I think things are a little bit more complex than that, but um, that's my personal stance. Um, but uh, it's a very interesting and burgeoning area of research and discussion and discourse in the field. So certainly keep your eyes on this space. Um, there's going to be a lot happening, I would say, over the next 10 years to resolve uh, the issue around uh, trauma and particularly complex trauma. So the Bs, everybody's saying B for question four, paranoid personality disorder, and the Bs are correct. That's right. So if we were seeing a, a, a pattern of experience that had impacted somebody and it, it was sort of centered around a, a pervasive mistrust and suspiciousness um, of others and that there was a desire to have people around. However, if there wasn't a desire, then maybe... You know, I'd be looking at something like schizotypal personality, um, but with a desire to have friends and connections and um, there being um, also um, this this close circle of, of friends who have sort of, you know, stood the tests of trustworthiness over time. Then, yeah, that's very typical of, of paranoid personality disorder, expecting to be taking advantage of, taken advantage of, uh, perceiving um, threat and um, insult where there actually is no threat or insult. Uh, these are other hallmarks of the disorder. Narcissistic personality disorder. There can certainly be a little bit of an um, uh, of overlap here, but here, uh, obviously, um, everybody's been talking about Donald Trump and narcissism over the over the weekend. Um, but uh, obviously a very different experience here. Um, and Andy, so I can't remember if we touched on all of these different experiences in the lectures. Um, but uh, if one had narcissistic personality disorder, you'd probably be, to a degree, less concerned about what other people might think to a point in that you might feel like there's only certain other people that could understand you anyway and so what the general masses might think about you it doesn't uh doesn't really matter because you're so special with antisocial personality disorder this is a very different pattern of uh behavior and and um, thinking and feeling and being lots of um, um tendency to um gain advantage through deception um uh, potential violence, um, manipulating others, and so forth. Uh, with histrionic personality disorder, we might be talking about uh, an experience where somebody wants to be the center of attention, be desired, particularly sexually, um, and uh, would be looking for that really shallow, uh, immediate sort of gratification around uh, attractiveness and so forth. So I, pro I probably did not touch on each one of these things in the lecture, uh, in the lecture series. All right, question five. Imagine that you're a psychologist again, and your new client reports experiencing uncontrollable worry about a range of things in life. They mentioned that this worry has lasted for over a year. What might be your client? Uh, what might your client be experiencing there? Do you think? So we've got panic disorder. A major depressive episode, generalized anxiety disorder, or schizophrenia. Which one of those? A, B, C, or D do we think? Well done, everyone. So it looks like the C's uh have it again this is good well done you guys have clearly been studying already that's right so if we're talking about worry and that worry being 
um, quite difficult to control and that worry sort of attaching itself to a range of things in life such that as one thing is resolved and maybe just we start worrying about something else and we're probably worrying about multiple things at the same time. That that really um, cognitive experience of anxiety, that's, that's what we're thinking about with that worry, generalized anxiety disorder, which is very different to panic disorder, of course, even though it's another experience of anxiety, but we're experiencing that very much in our body, aren't we? Uh, so panic disorder is about having those panic attacks where we might experience things like heart palpitations and sweaty palms and feelings of dread and difficulty breathing and uh, dizziness and nausea and so forth uh, and then start to worry about the um, experience occurring again. Uh, that's that's more uh, the panic uh, experience and for a large proportion of people who experience panic disorder you might remember they also experience agoraphobia or start to avoid um, situations in which the experience of a panic attack or escape from a panic attack might be problematic which makes complete sense doesn't it if you were having an unpredictable unpleasant experience like that you'd want to um, protect yourself from negative outcomes that might arise if you were having that sort of thing. Oh, Mayani coming in with the fire. Yes. So I was getting to answer Paul's uh, question, but well done, Mayani and Tatiana. Excellent job. Um, that's right. So as with all of or most of the um, experiences, in fact, all of the experiences that we've covered in first year, um, clinical psychology, we're not making, excuse me, we're not making diagnoses cross-sectionally. We are taking duration of the disturbance into account, the duration of the experience of signs and symptoms and the impact on functioning for the client. So these are very important um, time and duration. These are important things to consider. And um, uh, they can tell us a lot about the experience of um, uh, a certain mental health issue. And based on our knowledge of the developmental uh, trajectories and the etiology and, and the trajectories of, of mental health disorders, knowing what's happening for somebody over time can give us a good sense of what it is that somebody is experiencing and 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 um, that can then be really valuable in prognostication um good on you mayani well done making up for the first answer top job okay so that is the clinical psychology um section of the core uh, of the of the practice exam now of course that's not to say that um worry uh and essentially features of generalized anxiety disorder if not di diagnosable generalized anxiety disorder can't be experienced alongside these other conditions indeed that absolutely can um so um uh, we have got um you know in major depressive uh, disorder, for example, we'd quite commonly see that certainly if we looked at the lifetime, um, we would be seeing or expecting uh, there to be commonly uh, some experience of anxiety uh, and, and certainly also not uncommonly a co-occurring experience. Ow, I just bit my tongue. Co-occurring experience of anxiety, uh, whether that's in terms of panic-related symptoms or generalized anxiety symptoms um and certainly with schizophrenia we see that you know a large proportion of people with schizophrenia probably about 40 percent or more would meet criteria for an anxiety disorder as well at any given point in time um and uh you can imagine how there would be a complex interplay between anxiety symptoms and either depression symptoms or symptoms of schizophrenia 
in um, in any of these areas and how the symptoms would um, influence and compound each other uh, over time. Uh, so, yeah, my auntie's sort of right. The, the average onset uh, age for women uh, is later, and that's because we're talking about an average. So... Um, males and females will have an onset burst um, around 20 years of age, late teens, early 20s. And then again, yeah, that's right, mid 40s, you see um, another onset burst for women uh, around psychosis. And so why might this be hormones? Paul asks the question, indeed, that is one very plausible theory that might account for this second um a burst of onset for women more getting towards middle age. And so um, that is why you uh, have seen in the last sort of 15 years so much work around, um, so much work around the um, uh, this theory of, of hormones influencing psychosis. Uh, if you're interested in this idea, uh, at the um, Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre, um, uh, Professor J. Sheree Kolkani uh, leads a lab that has been looking at hormones and psychosis uh, for the last 10 or 15 years. And I've got a lot of really interesting work coming out of there. Okay, we're running out of time. Let's skip on through to um, the research methods questions so that we can uh, at least address them before we wind up. So, here we go. Imagine that you're a stigma researcher. Uh, you've been doing a, um, you've been investigating stigma in research student, uh, in university students, and you've collected two variables of data. You've got one looking at social distance. That's how you're measuring stigma. And you're also measuring um, people's knowledge about mental health issues. We might also call that mental health literacy. So when you look at the data, you find that the scores on the two surveys correlate. And as desire for social distance increases, um, mental health literacy decreases. So what pattern of correlation does this suggest? A positive correlation, a negative, a strong or a weak correlation? And to answer Paul's question there, in terms of psychosis for onset, um, uh, uh, onset for psychosis, this can occur at any time in life. These are just the peak onset periods. The 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 uh, the times at which they happen most commonly for men and women. Uh, is there impact into the research uh, impact research into the impact of sexism and anxiety? Uh, Naomi, I imagine there likely uh, would be. It's not my area though, but I would guarantee there would be research out there on this. So everybody's saying B, yes, B is right. So we've got this sort of X-shaped relationship as one thing goes up, if you imagined a, a, a cluster diagram, um, one thing goes up, the other goes down. So as the desire for social distance decreases, knowledge about mental health problems increase. So this is actually a, a real world um, pattern of correlation that we expect to see. People that have got more knowledge, more literacy around any particular issue are generally less scared of it and desire less... Um, less uh, distance from it or from people who are experiencing a particular issue. Okay, so next question here, a little bit more quantitative. A researcher wishes to infer a population mean from a sample of 20 people. 
Uh, they're not confident about their estimate, however, and they want to be more pre uh, precise. So what would you advise that they do to increase their precision? Or do they need to at all? This is a this is a question. So are they okay? Because central limit theorem assures them that the population mean is the same as their sample mean. I can't trick you, can I? Or well, some of you... Yes, okay, everybody's on it. All right, good. So yes, um, a larger sample should improve precision. So as our sample size increases the... Um, standard error of our distribution of sample means decreases and we get a more precise estimation of the population. Central limit does theorem does not assure us that the population mean is the same as our sample mean. That's the whole point of going through a statistical test to determine whether or not um, the uh, our sample mean uh, is similar to the mean of the distribution of sample means. Now, central limit theorem tells us that the mean of the distribution of sample means is going to be the same as the population mean, not the mean of our sample. Um, and with question B, given that every sample mean is different, they may, may need to take many sample means to be precise. That's just not something that you can pragmatically do in research. Um, there is a whole range of reasons why um, taking many different sample means is not necessarily a, a good thing nor a, an achievable thing. Generally, when we do a research study, we collect one group of people. There are um, statistical procedures that are brought to bear on things uh, that are called meta-analyses. I don't know if you've heard of these at all, but these are research projects that quantify um, the average um, effect of a given uh, a given um, variable. Uh, across many different studies that have quantified it. So if we uh, took all of the studies that have ever been done on um, <sighs> reducing stigma via education, for example, we could subject them to statistical analysis that would give us... Um, a, an, a basically an average measure, an average indication of what the effect size of an education-based um, intervention for stigma uh, actually is, what it does, taking all of the research into account, how much it works or not. Um, but that is a, that's a very separate issue and one that you'll learn about uh, in, in future years. Um, so, all right, have I, oh yeah, okay, good, all right. Uh, question 23, Pearson's R, Pearson's correlation test, rever uh, returns a p-value of 0 0.01. So the, the correlation of 0 0.01 means what? Does it mean that the correlation is likely to be present in the population? Does it mean that it's a strong correlation or a weak one or does it mean that you shouldn't reject the null hypothesis in other words there's no effect or very little effect Yeah, I was evil with this one, wasn't I, Mayani? This is a little bit, a little bit tricky. Yeah. 
you're you're all correct. So it is A. A is the correct answer. So the correlation is likely to be present present in the population based on a p-value of 0 0.01. So what this is saying here is that this is the correlation's statistical significance. Um, it's saying that we have um, tested uh, the likelihood of this correlation occurring if the null hypothesis is true and the null hypothesis would true uh, if sorry the null hypothesis of course is that there'd be no correlation between the two variables that we would be testing but we've tested the two variables and the scores well we don't know anything about the strength nor the direction of the correlation based on this data presented in this question we just know it was statistically significant it um, occurred um, with just one percent probability uh, that it would have happened if the null hypothesis was the case it's less than five percent it's one of these extreme findings we'd reject the null hypothesis we've got some evidence here that these two things are correlated um, so this is a significance level is telling us that um, in the context of a distribution of sample correlations just like there can be a distribution of sample means that this is an unlikely finding if the null hypothesis is to hold is to be correct we'd reject the null hypothesis then and vicariously this gives us um, uh, through uh, a distribution of sample correlations um, gives us um, a, an ability to make an inference and to comment upon a population. The statistical significance is all about saying this is likely to be present in the population or not. Of course, with correlations, we've got other things to think about, don't we? So the p-value is about statistical significance. The value of the correlation in terms of negative 1 through to positive one through zero to positive one that's going to tell us um well two things the positive or negative sign tells us about whether it's a positive or negative correlation correlation values above zero are positive below zero and between zero uh, and negative one i should say uh, a negative um, the closer a correlation is to one the stronger it is, the closer the correlation value comes back um, to zero. The the re the correlations were in the practical classes and the preparatory work for the practical class, Melissa. Um, and the um, closer it is to zero, uh, the the weaker the correlation. Zero means there's no correlation whatsoever. So three things to remember there with correlations. The statistical significance, the p-value, that tells you about whether or, like, whether or not this effect is likely to occur beyond the one sample that you're looking at. Next is the direction of the correlation, whether it's positive or negative. So as if it's negative, as one thing increases, the other thing decreases. That would be like that example that we talked about before with... Um, uh, mental health literacy and stigma as mental health literacy increased stigma decreased and if it was a really strong correlation then maybe we're talking about um, a correlation of r equals 0 0.07 or 0 0.08 for example um, so which ties in with Mayani's question here so if it was asking about R equals 0 0.01, the answer would be C. Yes, that's correct, Mayani. So R equals 0 0.01, that's very close to a correlation of zero. If it was R equals 0 0.1 even, or R equals 0 0.2, then these are very weak correlations. R equals 0.8 or 0.9, that's really strong. Um, very strong correlation. So, um, three things. Three things to remember with correlation, significance, direction, and strength. Okay. 
Um, thinking about Z scores and using a Z score of 1.96 as a threshold in a single sample Z test, what are we saying here? Are we saying that the alpha level is 5% and we're going to reject the null hypothesis if the probability of our sample mean occurring is greater than this? No, that's not it. If the alpha level, are we saying the alpha level is 2.5%? No. So we can immediately eliminate the 2.5%. They can be gone. And what we're looking for in a Z test is for a score to uh, a Z score for our sample mean to breach the threshold of 1.96. So say 2.05, 2.1, for example. Uh, and this is going to be giving us um, uh, an extreme value that is indicating that it would have occurred with less than 5% probability. Yeah, good. Number C. Number C? Question C. Answer C. Yes. Answer C is it. We're going to reject the null hypothesis if the probability of that sample mean occurring is less than 5% and the Z value that corresponds to the alpha level of 5% is 1.96. Very good team. Well done. All right. Last question. A repeated measures research design. Well, this is a bit of a nasty one too. Is analyzed using a t-test because it involves comparing a single sample with the population mean. Is analyzed using a t-test as the null hypothesis states that there is a difference between the two participant groups across time. Involves measurement of the same construct across two different samples at one time involves measurement of the same construct in a single sample at two different points in time. What do we think here? So if we were using a single sample with a population mean or population value that we theorized was equivalent to the population mean, we'd be thinking about a single sample t-test. That's not repeated measures. We'll throw that one out. So does the null hypothesis state that there is a difference between the two groups across time? No. The null hypothesis would state that there's no difference, remember? So whenever we talk about the null hypothesis, we're talking about a hypothesis of no effect. You can apply it to anything, absolutely anything. So the null hypothesis is that there's no relationship, there's no difference, there's no effect, nothing's going on. If you press the light switch, the null hypothesis would be that that would have no effect on your lights. And if you've paid your electricity bill, it should have an effect on your lights. So the null hypothesis is generally the opposite of what you're interested in. Okay, does a repeated measures design involve um, measurement of the same construct in two different samples at one time? No, it doesn't. The name gives you a hint. Repeated means doing something more than once. And does it involve measurement of the same construct in a single sample at two different points in time? Yes, it does. So the Ds have got it. Well done, uh, Ds. Good job. And yes, Paul, that is what your lab report was. It was a repeated measures design. So, there you have it. How was that? Did that help? Was that uh, useful to walk through those questions? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the the fact that some people are, and I, I think I know what it is, that some people can see answers. 
um, that are not coded in the back end. And that's, I think it's got to do with an app, an app that sort of bypasses Canvas settings. And it's caused a little bit of confusion, but hopefully this helps sort out some of that confusion. Oh, this was fun. Okay. Oh, that's good. We can do some more of this if you guys like. Would you like to do some more of this next week? Okay. Oh, good, Belinda. I'm glad it was helpful. Okay, good. Well, that's excellent. I'm, I'm, yeah, treat myself to a coffee. Can you see, I'm looking at my coffee cup and it's quite empty right now. And uh, my voice is starting to get a little bit hoarse. I'm, uh, I've just been talking for an hour and 15 minutes. So uh, that might be where we wind it up. But uh, I'm glad you found this helpful. So seeing that there's a positive response here, then I will um, set something up for next week and we'll do some more questions uh, next week uh, for the research methods and the clinical uh, sections, of course. All right, so that was good. Well done. Um, Let's do for social and developmental. Oh, Lord. Yeah, all right. Oh, God. Developmental psychology scares me. <laughs> all right. We'll see how we go. Okay, everyone. So that's where I'm going to call it for today because I am going to take a, uh, advantage of that opportunity to have a coffee. Um, and we will do some more of this in the coming week. Um, but I uh, will have to shoot off now because I have gone a little bit over time. And I've got to get ready for my next meeting <coughs> and be ready to talk before my next meeting. So I um, hope that was useful, everyone. And... Um, uh, keep on sending me any questions you've got in the background and I'll keep on getting back to you. Um, I think everything's tracking uh, along. Okay, can we please not have developmental on the exam? Uh, yeah, Freddie. Uh, well, I, I think I'd be in trouble, but uh, yeah, it might have to be there. I'm sorry about that. All right, everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, hope you all have a great week. Enjoy your freedom. Yeah, things are getting a little bit more freer in Melbourne, in Victoria. Enjoy this beautiful day that's out there. I'm going to try and work through to about 3 p.m., uh, given that I've been on since 6 a.m. this morning. And I'm going to try and not let this bleed into a 12-hour day. I'm going to try and work till about 3. And uh, then I'm going to get out on my motorbike and... Uh, go for a ride and then go for a walk, take Charlie for a walk and get some exercise. So I hope that you are also finding uh, an opportunity to break your study days up a little as well and, and um, not sit at your desk for 12 hours straight, but breaking it up, getting a little bit of exercise and looking after yourself and taking some time off as well. Paul's off to the gym. Bravo. Well done, Paul. Good stuff. All right, everyone, take care. I will see you really soon. Um, have a great week and uh, I will see you next Monday. All right, everyone, bye now.